the idea came really about being exposed to the problems that we set our business up to solve um, or to be a part of combating. And those problems were um, made very clear to me when I was on a trip through Southeast Asia to see human trafficking firsthand. And I witnessed a young girl that was for sale and it was a, it was a life changing moment because it was just so obvious how scared and intimidated she was to be there. Um, and, and as I spoke to the, um, the rescue agency representative that had, that had taken me to see what was happening, um, he just said, James, if you look around, you'll see that these young girls are everywhere. So today we're talking with James Bartle, founding CEO of a company that's called Outland Denim, which you may have heard about since the princess, who's no longer the princess, um, <laughs> Mrs. Megan Markle wore his jeans and we're going to talk about that story and we're also going to be talking about um just the company but before that time because i think people normally hear about it kind of after some like event and say wow you're so lucky but they don't actually hear about that first part of actually creating yeah, a company to get to a point that the princess at the time would wear it yeah, yeah. um so welcome to the podcast thank you so good to be here yeah cool man um so Let's just start with how did you get the idea for Outland Denim? And just for the people um, who don't know, um, this started off as an ethical company um, that manufactures, um, I think like, it's only like jeans at the time, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. A certain way. And it's moved into sustainability as well. So you know, it's now both an ethical plus a sustainable company. But let's start with actually, how did you get the idea for Outland Denim? Well, look, I, um, the idea came really about being exposed to the problems that we set our business up to solve um, or to be a part of combating. And those problems were um, made very clear to me when I was on a trip through Southeast Asia to see human trafficking firsthand. And I witnessed a young girl that was for sale and it was a, it was a life-changing moment because it was just so obvious how scared and intimidated she was to be there. Um, and, and as I spoke to the, um, the rescue agency representative that had, that had taken me to see what was happening, um, he just said, James, if you look around, you'll see that these young girls are everywhere. And um, the, the, the problem is, is, is huge. It's, it's deeply rooted in, in um, being born into a poor economy. Um, and so therefore it was really clear to me that it needed to be something that was giving, uh, creating employment opportunity for them to be able to rebuild um, rebuild, I guess, their futures um, based in something that was a lot more stable. And I guess the, the reason I chose denim was um, I always wanted to be a cowboy when I grew up. And so um, it just goes hand in hand. And, um, you know, I didn't want to make T-shirts. I love, love jeans, always have loved denim. And so um, that's the reason that we, we chose to go down this road. And that was 10 years ago. That was 10 years ago. And what's it's such um, a fantastic reason to start a company you know like like i think everybody has a good reason but i think um to have such a good impact or a positive impact like in what is like a horrible horrible thing that's happening in the world um is such an interesting kind of a way to start um have you always kind of had that kind of i guess like a background of like you know trying to help the world in some way um yeah look i, I guess i've always been reasonably compassionate so I've always seen things and you know I feel moved when I see some of those injustices that are happening around the world and I I, I guess um, you know I was raised with parents that were always bringing somebody in off the street that needed support of some kind you know so it was um, you know I couldn't count how many times I've had to hop out of my bed as a kid to give it to somebody else and I just I'm so grateful for that um, upbringing to just see firsthand what it looked like to um, to love on your community. Um, so I, I, I come by, I guess the, the desire to do this quite honestly, because my parents were so um, committed to this kind of thing. Um, I guess I'm entrepreneurial as well. And, um, you know, I get quite excited about new ideas and, and mm -hmm. especially when we're talking about big issues, you know, and, you know, imagine if that kind of uh, conversation would be often heard between my friends and I as, as I was growing up. And um, so I think that, you know, moving into this kind of business was 
uh, really just a natural progression of, you know, what I'd been exposed to as a kid and then moving through being entrepreneurial. I'm loving denim, I'm seeing a need and being so deeply moved by it um, that it just made too much sense. And, you know, as we've gone further down this road in this journey, we, we have discovered that, you know, like if you want to create a product that's got the ability to change the world, I mean, I reckon denim is the best. And I, and I say that for a number of reasons. One is, which I wasn't aware of at the time, it's the hardest product to make. So there's a lot of love, a lot of effort and thought that goes into creating a beautiful gene. Um, but then it's also one of the worst um, contributors to the environmental degradation that, con that continues to havoc um, these poor countries that we produce our, our clothing in. And so you go, well, if, it, if it's that product, then I've got a great opportunity to be able to change that and create a new way of processing um, denim that doesn't um, destroy the environments that it's produced in. Um, and then on the maker's level, you know, it's, it's an amazing product to be able to train people on. And it's a product that everybody has. And it's a product that those that have bought a nice pair of jeans before probably never want to throw them out. And in fact, I think they're a little bit like a song where you wear them and they remind you of an occasion. They're that kind of product. It's like they absorb history. Like they're, mm. it's an, it, and I don't think there's another garment that does this. And so I, I just love jeans and I love denim for mm -hmm. that very, very reason is that they, they absorb history. They have so much meaning. And so when you associate that to changing somebody's life in a positive way, it's really powerful. Um, and so I guess that's how we, we found ourselves in, in producing jeans. Yeah, sure. I mean, just on that point, um, just there's a quick anecdote. Like I just threw away a pair of my favorite jeans that had rips and holes so bad they couldn't even be fixed anymore. Yeah, and I threw good. them away and I felt really sad at the time. So yeah, I completely <laughs> understand like the connection to jeans. Like, like I have yeah. some now, that's my kind of the thing every day that, that I wear. Um, yeah. And we'll come back um, to the sustainability part of it, but you started this thing 10 years ago. How long did it take you to actually sell the first pair of jeans? Because you, because like you get the idea and the idea, which is really interesting, came from a combination of your upbringing plus an entrepreneurial spirit, which is oftentimes how like a lot of companies are made. So, which is a fantastic, fantastic thing for the world. Um, but then the first pair of jeans, but how long did it take? Well, man, like I remember the first pair of jeans within the first, you know, month or two that we made, we were learning and I was so excited to try them on and they were just the worst things you've ever seen, you know. So, <laughs> it was so disheartening and it was at that point that I realized how difficult this was going to be. And that was then years of training, getting experts in to help train our staff to get to a level where we could make jeans. You know, um, most of our staff came from a background of having no sewing skills. So this was a completely new skill that they needed to learn. Um, Look, we didn't launch our brand until the end of 2016. Um, we spent um, those first six and a half years in developing and proving the business model, proving that this pulled people out of poverty, um, proving that you could use a product like this to create, um, you know, really substantial change within not just its makers' lives, but their families and then beyond into their community as well. So we spent that time doing that. And during that time, we were making and selling jeans at things like um, markets and festivals and friends and family um, to, to, to learn about, you know, how the market responded to the product, how they responded to the story um, before we launched our brand. So we'd sold, we'd sold, oh, I, I would estimate maybe, gosh, I don't know, maybe $50,000 worth of jeans in those first six years, learn, developing, learning um, how to do this. Mm. And I tell you, we sold some shockers in that time. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, it also proved that people really do want to be a part of this. People really do want to see this change and they supported it. And today we have beautiful jeans that um, they buy because of the product and the, the impact of that product helping people and planet is just the cherry on top. So it seems really difficult then. Well, cool. I'll start again. It's hard to start a company definitely right like that yeah. it's kind of the hardest thing it seems like it becomes exponentially harder to create a social impact company yeah that is based on the ethical approach to helping the world right yeah. what were some of the challenges in that process 
oh man, where do I start? It, and there's still, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, those challenges are still there today. You know, when you talk about um, working with um, different cultures, I mean, there's, that's your biggest one. Um, we bring, uh, you know, I'm Australian. I have seen business operated in a certain way. I've been taught certain things about the way it should be done. And I'm not just talking in business. I'm talking about in, um, you know, your people skills, relating with people. How do you manage a team? And so you go in and you try and work in a culture that operates entirely different. Um, and you try and make them adopt your way of doing things. And it took me so long. It took years and years for me to realize that this was, this was the biggest mistake. One of the biggest mistakes I've made. Um, if we really want to work within someone else's culture, we've got to understand their culture. We've got to go in and, and be able to see the benefits in the way that they work and then try and adapt that to the business that we, we are running. So um, that was a big challenge and continues to be, and, but is also one of the greatest learnings that I think that we've had is we need to operate to the strengths of their culture versus make them operate to the strengths of a culture that they've never experienced. Um, but uh, beyond that, you know, um, you know, it costs way more to produce. Um, this is really difficult to produce product where you aren't exploiting anybody. And unfortunately, industries, not just the fashion industry, but most industries um, have been on this slippery slope into this dark place that we've all just, like all of a sudden found ourselves in, opened our eyes and gone, oh man, like I can't, I can't sleep well at night knowing that the products I'm buying are doing this to the environment or are doing this to the people that live within it. So we've had to adapt and change. And we've been on this journey, like I said, for 10 years of trying to find new ways to create product where you can feel good in it. You can feel really good knowing that no one was exploited in this process. This is the, this is creating the most minimal impact on the environment of any of the products that you're going to find in the marketplace. And so that's a, I think a really exciting um, place to be um, where you can see that a product is the change maker. And I think that's what's really exciting for our future is that as we create products that are going to be the catalyst of creating that kind of change, then we will see greater change rather than us needing to make donations to see the change happen. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. And I can, I totally hear what you're saying about it's more expensive, you know, like everything would be more expensive and like kind of trying to get from the ethical side of things where you fit into their culture and you can create product that people actually want to buy, yeah. right? Like in that process and then scaling that up with the demand would be something like, I can't even imagine the difficulty of that. It's hard enough scaling up something if you just import it from China, right? Just sure. like if yeah. you just import it from China, that's still really, really hard. But now you're having to create a manufacturing process yeah. and you're going to have to get like, everybody on board for that. Then you have to actually sell these things like at, a price point that there's a margin, then you have yeah. to be able to create the systems behind the manufacturing to be able to handle the increase in demand. Right? Like, is exactly. that like a kind of summary on some that's of your it. challenges? That's, absolutely. Absolutely, man. Like it's, um, it's consistent, consistently challenging to create systems that work. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a micromanager, so I've, um, I've had to rely heavily on, the team members that, that are, that they can see those micro details. Um, you know, it's, it's really important that you have very good, clear, strong vision. We want to get to here, but then you need a really solid team to be able to go and um, put those things in place that, that mean that we can how essentially we, we operate two businesses, you know, um, we have a manufacturing business and we have a, a brand that sells product. And so um, it's been twice as hard as setting up a brand for sure. Um, but the, the payoff for that, um, I believe, uh, as we move into the future is going to be massive. You know, we, we talk about COVID, like the things that we've just, uh, we're still going through right now here in Australia um, and, and worldwide. Uh, that, that has made people stop and think about the way we do things. It's, it's certainly put pressure on, you know, this on globalization and how we, we do import and export so much and some's good, some's bad. And so it's, I think, I think it's exciting because we're rethinking how we do things. But for us, we see it as a benefit as having that control over our first year, over our manufacturing, making sure that no one's exploited, that people have benefited, that we're able to show our customers that and that we can be entirely transparent about it, um, creates 
a pretty unique opportunity for a brand in today's day and age where consumers are now starting to demand to see these things. They're boycotting. Cancel culture has become a real thing. It's a, a not necessarily a good thing, but um, you know, brands are being boycotted um, once they're exposed as to what's really happening behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So I think that our brand is in a really strong position to be able to go into the future um, with, with the way we see society changing. And then you move from ethical to sustainable as well. So you're both ethical and sustainable. At what point, like in the journey, what did that happen? Was that recently or was that a few years ago? Yeah, no. Well, look, I mean, I call sustainability, um, I refer to that as three things. I, th I, I say sustainability is social, environmental, and economic. Um, and they can't be separated. And I think the, um, that as we start to talk about sustainability um, like this, I think that we, we then... Um, start to address everything that needs to be addressed within our businesses. Um, and so when we talk about the environmental sustainability, um, that, that was, look, when I started, I had no interest. I, if you had have talked to me about, I often say this, if someone had have talked to me about um, the environmental degradation of the fashion industry, I would have thought they were tree hugging hippie. Um, I would have <laughs> said, oh, you must live in Byron Bay. Eh? You know? <laughs> but honestly, yeah. man, you can't turn you you can't turn a blind eye to it when you see it and i saw it and i saw what was happening and i see the way that um the the communities um that our staff live in are being impacted by industry and um you know the, the pollution and the the lack of care or the lack of education around um how important our environment is and so I was just moved and I knew, and I wanted to learn more and I, I started to learn about it. And, um, you know, as our team learned more about it, we just realized we can't not do something about this. And so this is probably, I would say, Oh, look, maybe four years into the process, we started to really go, no, we need to do something about this. Um, by the time, by the time we launched, um, our brand, we were well down that, that journey of, um, this all happened before you even launched. So like oh, yeah. that first four and a half years, you went through many journeys, it seems yeah, like. Yeah, it, it was endless. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, because all these, like, is really good framing for what happens next, right? Because yeah. you launched this thing, right? And that was, so that means, like, you, you, you started to sell jeans to the public in around 2016, right? That's right. Something yeah. like that? Yeah. And then, like, you got super lucky and yeah. the princess actually just wore your jeans, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm just tr tr trying to be funny there. There's a lot yeah, of hard work between those points, no, right? We are, we, but, are, we are super But lucky. what happened between 2016 and she wore it in 2018, is that right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. What happened in that time that she found out about it and that she wore it, you yeah. know? Well, look, it was really, it was really fast growth. We were growing really quickly. Um, we launched our brand, you know, we saw that the media um, picked it up, talked about it a little bit, which gave us the next opportunity. Somebody you'd hear about it. We started selling jeans online. They started to move. We'd get the odd retailer um, helping and trying to sell this product, but it was a hard slog. Um, and then I, I actually got, uh, well, my wife and, and a, um, uh, some of our friends that felt like, oh, there's this this great CEO summit in New York. You should go to it, WWD summit. And I'm like, oh, no way. That's going to cost like 10 grand. We're already skint. We're already trying to keep this thing going, but they really felt I should go. And so I did. And I remember, I remember being, you know, slightly excited about hearing what the future of fashion is going to look like. I'm going to hear from Ralph Lauren and like these, these leaders in the space. And I just remember feeling so disheartened because all I heard from the entire industry, the entire event was how to reduce cost, where the industry is going, what country to go to next. And I was just like, this is a disgusting industry. Um, I don't want a part of this, man. The leaders in our industry are talking about what country, they didn't say it like this, but essentially what they were saying is what country can we exploit next? Right. And I remember feeling sad um, listening to this and going, I don't think I fit. I felt, I remember saying to my wife, I feel like a duck out of water. Like I just, I'm not, I don't fit in here. And um, I sat at this table beside this guy and he, um, he's a really friendly guy. He's a Canadian guy. And uh, he says, uh, Oh, what do you, what do you do? And I told him and he said, Oh, are they the jeans you're wearing? And I said, yeah, yeah. 
So he, he just reaches right over, grabs a handful <laughs> of jeans, and he's like, oh, yeah, they, they seem pretty good. Well, tell all your investors that you're about to lose all yours and their money too. And I'm like, oh, awesome. Anyway, this guy invites me to have lunch with him and his wife, and I sit down, we're having lunch, and um, I tell his wife got it. He didn't yet. And uh, he, um, you know, he turns out to be a um, fashion distributor in Canada, one of the, the mm-hmm. biggest distributors there. And so um, I stayed in touch with him for the next six months. He's just a real great guy. Like, he's happy to help and support how he could, but, you know, he didn't really have the belief straight away. Eventually, he said, well, why don't you jump on a plane and bring some jeans over and come and see us? And so I did. I thought this is a big opportunity and mm-hmm. jumped on a plane. I remember landing in uh, Toronto and... Um, we, he'd never seen the jeans other than what I was wearing. I threw them out on the table of his boardroom and they looked at me and said, oh, they look pretty good. And he goes, okay, I'll take a risk. So he rang the three biggest retailers in Canada, um, Harry Rose's Hot Renfrew and an independent retailer there. Um, and I'll never forget walking into that, that boardroom and showing these, these buyers the jeans and they said, we'll give you 20 minutes. And we threw the jeans out on the table and thinking, oh man, like this is going to be... <laughs> Yeah, this is scary. And an hour and a half later, they're still with us and they're giving us insight on how to improve product and how to be better at selling and, and, and committing to buying our product. We went to the next retailer, same day, within an hour of the meeting, they sent an email back saying, yep, we're going to stock your product. Um, and, and he said, you know, in, in his 30 years in fashion, he'd never seen a response to a brand like that. And he's now one of our biggest investors. And so- oh, wow. It just goes to show, you know, like you've got to follow the path and, you know, you don't know what's going to come out of anything. And I've had been those retailers in Canada, Harry Rosens and Holt Renfrew have been such incredible supporters. And what it says to me is that these, these leaders in our industry are there to create change. They want to use the fashion industry to create change. And that's why they said they, they gave uh, a little brand from Australia ago that happened. We then just signed with David Jones in Australia. Um, so we were growing quite quickly and it was, it, was, it was already difficult to keep up cash flow and you know, um, you know, HR staffing needs, all of these things, especially when you're working with um, people that have come from traumatic backgrounds, you know, there's mm. additional challenges there in the workplace. And then I landed with um, our brand manager um, in Cambodia and we um, woke up the next morning and our phones were full of messages. They were going mad and people were trying to get in touch and I sleep with my phone on silent. And so when I, when I sort of looked at everything going on, turns out that Meghan Markle had um, stepped off an aeroplane in Dubbo um, wearing our jeans. And it was insane. I, I'll never forget. I hopped in a tuk-tuk to drive out to our, um, our production facility and I was with my team. And I think there's four of us in the back of this poor little tuk-tuk. And, um, I just remember feeling how overwhelming this was to see um, the response that we were getting worldwide um, from media everywhere, from retailers everywhere, wanting to know about this little Australian brand that has this product that this princess has worn. Um, you know, that was, that was a, a definitely a big moment for our brand. No, no question. It, it made us known to the world. Whereas before that, you know, yes, we had launched with the best department stores in Canada and we were launching with the best department store in Australia, but, um, most people didn't know who we were and um, mm. Meghan Markle made that possible. But I, I think, I mean, I think what's most remarkable about um, Meghan Markle wearing our product was that it had a, such a, a profound impact on our brand. It meant that we hired 46 new seamstresses as a result of her wearing our product once, you know, um, incredible like it changed our brand it, it spoke to the reason we exist um and i think it's because the alignment with with her was so good um you know mm. she does care about these things and she does yeah. stand for human rights issues and um in particular you know around um women and um you know marginalized women and and and, and just what we speak to and so it was just a really powerful moment for our brand and we've not stopped growing since and What's really interesting about um, that story is that, you know, well, A, you get to see the, 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 the full power of a true influencer. I don't think there's going to be, apart from Kim Kardashian, which is a different kind, the princess yeah. is like up there, right? Yeah, and yeah. I think like the impact 
that somebody like that can have on the brand is huge. Yeah. Now, yeah. when that impact then leads to good things happening in the world, that's that kind of kind of the ethical kind of benefit of that company, right? It's like the more we sell, the more we help. And I think yeah. that's what people don't get, especially people like who are listening to this podcast and who are basically in the marketing game, right? And they're sure. trying to find the hook and the angle so that in social media, we get more kind of yeah. likes and engagement and stuff. But, but like if you can create something truly ethical and truly engaging, it's a self-supporting cycle where it actually helps the world. The more that yeah. you sell, the better yeah. that the brand does, the more people that you help, you know? And that's yeah. like, and I think, you know, because, you know, we have some clients as well, that are in this space as well. And in social media, the sharing that happens, right? Like, like the, um, the, the passion of yeah. people yeah. To just kind of help to get the brand out, to stand behind it, to share this thing, because yeah. by sharing this thing, this is what I believe. Yeah. Right. And Absolutely. like, is that what you've seen as well in terms of yeah, no the question. social media impact of this? No question at all. Look, I, I think, you know, what we've learned over, over the, you know, years we've been in this and in particular the last four years since launching our brand is that our focus needs to be on being very real and authentic and people, um, people can, uh, I guess, relate to us in some way then because they know what they're relating to. I mean, it's a, um, uh, I think it's one of the most powerful tools we have. And then that is, I guess, aligning with the, the smaller audience that, aligns with our brand versus trying to be too big and go too wide and appeal, appeal to everybody. Um, they're lessons we've had to learn and are still learning. Um, but the, the more we narrow in on, on that person who cares, you know, we're, we're, we just keep telling that authentic story. Um, we see our community grow. We see our community support us. I think one of the greatest examples, we did an equity crowdfunding campaign just recently and we did it right during COVID right down, right after lockdowns. Um, you know, advice was don't continue, but you know, we, we had this belief that no matter what the economic situation is, we believe that we had some element of being recession proof. And the reason I believe that is because of oh, it's a very real and authentic movement and an impact that's had by buying this product. And I believe that most people want to be a part of creating that kind of impact. So if we can make it easy enough for people to do that, then it will still happen regardless of the situation um, we find ourselves economically. Well, um, we went through the campaign, we raised over a million dollars. Um, we were the fastest campaign that they had had to hit our minimum target. Um, and this was all during a pandemic. And so it proved to me that we have a, a um, customer out there. We have a community out there that align with the values of our brand. And it's because of the values of our brand that we have such, um, uh, stoic support from them. And, um, I don't think that can be fabricated. Um, I don't think you can manipulate that. I think that it's either real or it's not because I think mm. customers can, um, uh, they can tell. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that's why we've, we've got quite a solid little business now. How did you balance um, the massive spike in demand after the princess wore yeah. your jeans and the requirement to be ethical? right? Because you've got this once in a lifetime opportunity right now to help the world as much as possible, if you can harness it. Yeah. How did you balance that? Oh, just, we, we just about fell over actually, to be perfectly honest. You know, it was, so, it was growth that was so quick um, that um, we risked losing culture within our workplace. Um, it was a very difficult time um, and we learned so much from it. And so what, what I did learn is um, there's always another opportunity. Um, and you know, as long as we stay true to what it is that we do, you know, um, since then we've had Leonardo DiCaprio wear our product as well. And, you know, like, so it's, it's, um, these, and, and other incredible and Australian celebrities. I mean, uh, Isabel Lucas, who lives down near you, like, you know, yeah, yeah. um, really cool people out there that really have, have backed and supported our brand continuously. And I would say, um, that, the greatest lesson in that, that really fast growth was that um, the bucket analogy, um, you know, we've got to fill that bucket, um, the capacity of the bucket to a certain level, but then not let it overflow 
because we need a bigger bucket. And so mm. we needed to get more capacity before we could grow again. And But what I did in this situation was I overflowed the bucket because I was like, um, this is a, like you say, a once in a lifetime opportunity. We need to make hay while the sun shines. And so we were going at it. And um, in hindsight, I go, I should have stopped a little bit sooner and got a bigger bucket and then gone and filled it again. So it's um, it's been a big learning for us. Yeah, but you know, like I think um, you can be a, a bit easier on yourself because in hindsight, you didn't know that there were going to be all these other celebrities wearing it. You didn't know... <laughs> what was going to happen or like, I can't even imagine like how many missed calls on your phone. You like, would have been like, has the world stopped? Like, like yeah. what's happened? What the hell's <laughs> going on? You must've been really excited when you saw oh. the princess has worn it. What the, what the heck? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh man. It was like mind blowing. Absolutely mind blowing. You know, like I jumped on an airplane that night. So I'd only been there for one night. I had to fly back to Australia because we had all these media opportunities, which was so good for us. Um, but yeah, I remember we were sitting with our, our brand manager on the tuk-tuk and his phone would get that notification every time an online sale was made at the time. Cause think, remember at the time too, we're selling jeans in Australia. Like we're, um, it's a hot country. Um, jeans is something that most people don't buy online until they know if they like them or not. But our phone just, his phone was just going ding, ding, ding. Like it was incredible. Wow. <laughs> and yeah. so indie sales just flow in and, and look, we sold out of that product really quickly and, and, um, <laughs> One thing <laughs> is if she wears something, they want exactly what she wore. And so it flowed out into other products a little bit, but not heaps. If we, if we, we could have sold millions of products if we had it, but we sold out, we took pre-orders. People waited six months to get a gene, you know, like, so, um, yeah, look, it was a, it was a time that I'd love to have again, to be able to do it differently. Um, yeah. to be honest, but, um, it was still an incredible opportunity for us. That's just put us on the map. Um, yep. you know, we have a long way to go. We're still a small brand, um, but we've, we've got really big ambitions. Yeah. And that's great. And like, I just wanted like, you know, just to spend a couple of minutes on that, just because you spent so long putting this thing together, you know, from, you know, the, like, like the first five years at the markets and, you know, traveling, creating this thing and to have this at the end, just be so confirmed that it's a good idea by this thing happening it just would have been like okay cool <laughs> it's yeah. like it's working um cool. let's just jump quickly um to what happened since that point right like like in terms of your strategy in terms of the marketing strategy um but has it stayed the same or has it changed like has it now kind of tr 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 transitioned more to say online how has it changed since then yeah, look, I mean, actually, my strategy was always quite different to what we hear in the marketplace. You know, we hear a lot about being the disruptor of the industry and, you know, Arjun. But see, my bottom line isn't just measured by the economic impact. It's measured by the social and environmental as well. So I know that for me to be able to have that impact across those three measures, we need volume. And if we need volume, the best way to get volume is by using existing retailers. You know, one in six people work within the fashion industry. I see that it's our duty as somebody who benefits from fashion to be able to benefit this industry. So by just going direct, I, I actually see that as not necessarily a positive thing. I, I get that there's more margin. I, I get all of the benefits to the mm -hmm. brand. It's the industry that will make the change. It's not Outland Denim that will make the change. We're just one small piece of making that, that change. So what we need to do is we need to sell through retailers. We need to partner with retailers and department stores, and we need the community to support those retailers. And if we do that, we create local jobs um, and we create an economy, which is now becoming the, um, the engine house of creating the change. So yes, direct is important and COVID has, has forced us to go direct to consumer and put more effort into that. And it's been, an, it's been amazing because it's propping up our business. Um, but I still want bricks and mortar retailers to be here. I still want community to go out and enjoy each other and enjoy the outdoors and being able to go and sh go shopping and, you know, support each other in that way. So I, I, I am, my strategy remains to be that yes, online is really important. Uh, it, no question. But let's not forget the retailers. Let's not let them all die during COVID. Let's look for ways to support them. Let's, mm -hmm. you know, so, so that's the goal. Sell more products and sell them in ways that benefits more people rather than less. And 
that's a fantastic um that's a fantastic explanation and you can see the value of a good strategy and seems like you want to have the biggest impact on the world and so you're going down the hardest paths possible yeah right yeah. and i think that's a big lesson for people is that you know if you want to achieve something big it's hard yeah. it's hard and long and you've got to have some some grit and you're gonna it's gonna be pain a lot yeah. of pain right yeah. across that journey isn't it but man, I reckon that I reckon we've got to change our mentality to the way we look at that. You know, like we need to understand from the outset, this isn't going to be easy. It's not going to happen overnight. You know, you know, where where the overnight success that happened over the last ten years, and we still got a long way to go. Like, hey, we're we're not home and hosed. Um, we're we're still a small brand with big ambitions. But you know, it's those challenging times that mean that we're going to be good at what we do. If we if we want to avoid them, if we're not prepared to go through the trenches, if we're not prepared to be knocked down and get up again, then that's as good as we'll be. Um, but I believe that um, this will work. I believe that this will change thousands of people's lives um, around the world. And for that reason, I, I am just going to keep going and going and going. And if we get knocked down, I'm going to get up again because this is that important. This is yeah. not about fashion. This is about future this is about freedom for more people this is about environmental freedom imagine if we could innovate and create products that left the world in a better position as a result of being created imagine if the byproduct of the things that we bought meant that the people that made it every stakeholder everyone who touched that product on its way through was benefited what if the environment was benefited just as a result of us buying a product and i'm not going to stop until we get to that point um because I think that that's what's really going to change the world. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. Um, the people um, who watch this podcast and um, who listen to this podcast, they're senior leaders like in, I'd say, organizations of all sizes, right? And so they do have influence in this kind of area, right? They could, they could make the change or they could start the process of like making that change. Yeah. Like, what would you advise them like, as a place to start? Right, because all these are existing companies. Yeah, they're not startups. Yeah, and there's a company, and there's now a person who's now like in the senior management, and they have some influence, right? And they have yeah. some potential impact, and they believe in this. Yeah. What do you say to someone like that? Because it seems like such a massive thing to approach, right? It is. It is a big thing to approach. First thing is you. It's your heart, and I think it's just stopping and asking yourself okay, um, you know, am I being the person I want to be by uh, endorsing this or endorsing that, you know? So what do I want to stand for? What, what, what's my legacy? You know, I think, I really think everything starts there. Um, you know, when you know that you want to be a part of creating change uh, through the influence, through the, uh, the, the avenues you have access to, um, then you look for the opportunity. And once that's happening, then I would say the next steps, I mean, it is difficult. It's going to be harder. It's going to cost more. So you've got to go back and look at your business model and can you adapt it? Can you change it? It's not about being there today. It's not about changing everything overnight. It's about making the next step and the next step um, toward using your influence to create more benefit for more people for the planet. Um, I, I, I mean, one of the reasons we've actually adapted our business slightly is that, um, we have now just started manufacturing for other brands. And the reason we've done that is I see that other brands have way greater power than we do. Um, what if we were making their clothing? What if we were able to go, Hey, by making your clothing with us, you're able to have the same impact as us because it's not easy for a big brand to just go and shift and change. And so the leadership may desperately want to do it, but the business hasn't been set up to be able to. And so, um, I think that it's it's now a great time to be able to go to businesses and say, well, we can make this product for you and you can still sell it to your audience. So now your audience, your customer can can be a part of creating this change and and ultimately work together as an industry to to see, you know, the old way abolished and the new way become the normal. Um, and man, like I won't have a marketing angle anymore when that happens, which will be cool. Yeah, and so, so there's so many interesting parts of this, this conversation. I think the first part is that you care less about your brand than you do about changing the industry. And so you don't mind if you're even kind of the behind the scenes part, right? Just where 
There's other brands out there because they're now supplying or purchasing, purchasing stuff from you. Yeah. It's changing the world faster. So that's really interesting. But your mindset, you have less ego than a lot of other companies because the purpose in the company is to change the world and you're going the fastest way that you can there, right? Like that way, this way, this way. Yeah. And that's important. And don't get me wrong. Um, I've got an ego and I'm a prideful guy at times. And sometimes I get blinded by the lights and I want, I want it. And I want our brand to be the biggest brand. And don't get me like, man, I'm still, I, I'm a human. Who, You're who still knows. a person. <laughs> yeah. I have those issues. But when yeah. I stop, like I talked about before, like when, when you stop and you say, well, who do you want to be? What's your legacy? Um, I go, no, I don't, I don't want to be that guy. I want to be, I want to be the guy that, was a part of facilitating this this change and and we're a small part there's so many amazing people out there that are fighting for this same fight as us um we're just one small part but man if we can use our business to create greater change more rapidly then we must i know people i know people who are on those in those situations of exploitation i i mean i I talk about often this one young lady that um has actually moved now. She's about 18, but she's married. And, but as a 14 year old, she um, was taken and, and um, she was a slave in a garment factory in Malaysia. And her friend was taken with her and her friend actually died in the garment factory because they're literally slaves and they're just, they just, uh, you know, get someone else if, they, if one dies. Uh, until she was rescued and she came to work with us and um, uh, referred on by an NGO. And it was, been, it was an absolute privilege for us to be able to work with her to um, help her develop her skills and independence so that she was no longer a victim. And um, she was a survivor who is courageous and has gone and forged a wonderful life for herself. Um, but those people are out there today those people are actually the ones making the majority of our clothing that we wear and we turn a blind eye to. Um, oh. And I just want us to go, you know what, if I can only own one or two pairs of jeans versus 10, but I know that I'm not endorsing that mm. and the world changes, it changes really quickly. And um, I know it's hard to understand the power of your dollar, but the power of your dollar is so, so powerful, so powerful. When the bigger brands who don't necessarily operate to the standards they should see that people will no longer buy their products, they will rethink the way they make them. They will rethink the way their business operates. And it's at that point that we have a very exciting opportunity. When brands like Outland Denim become a threat to the big players, it's at that point that we have an extremely exciting opportunity to be able to create way greater change in the world. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. And so if you're in a company and you want to start to make change, start small. Yeah. Start small, change something which you can control that will help the world in some small way. Yeah. It could be the company who you work with. It could be the suppliers that, 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 uh, yeah. Uh, providing you uh, services or product or whatever else it is. Right. It's kind of, but like if you have a budget which you control, you actually have an impact at that point on how you choose to spend it. So everybody has an impact, especially like in business. And in business, there's more leverage because of the volume of what people are purchasing and spending and so on, right? Exactly Is that, right. yeah. Absolutely, and I, and I think even beyond that, you know, like um, those that don't necessarily have control over a budget, um, but those that do as well, you know, education like you know you get convicted on something like this and now it's like okay now i've got a great opportunity to be able to speak into and educate my my colleagues um make them aware of the issues that you've found um within maybe your supply chain um as you do that with your colleagues you know you're you're expanding on the community that are going to be a part of this and i a guy that's a real hero to me is um a guy named william wilberforce who uh, lived in the uh, early to mid 1800s. Um, he was a uh, politician who um, what he and his team were responsible for the abolishment of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, okay. he, he had to fight three days after it was passed through parliament. He, um, he actually died 
And um, but this man made this statement, which has always been quite um, impactful to me. And it, and it was that if you want to change anything, first you need to change people's affections. And um, I think that that's really important. And I feel like we've lost that today. I mean, if we look at the way we interact with each other on social media, we look at uh, whether it's the Black Lives Matters movement or, um, you know, protesting about anything, activism about anything. Um, I think we've lost a little bit of um, the element of respect and a little bit um, we've, we've forgotten that if you really want to change someone, you need to change your affections. I'll take me as an example. Initially, I didn't care about the environmental impact. I really did not care. Um, I didn't believe it. I thought it was all a bunch of hype. Um, and the reason was because I felt forced into it. I felt like um, I was judged for not believing the same thing. Um, and therefore my wall went up and actually those that were trying to make create change were having a very, um, in fact, negative impact because I probably, my nature was to push back against it. So I'd go further the other way. But when I saw it, and I saw it in a way that wasn't confronting in that you are the problem or, and I saw what was really happening. Um, I was exposed to it. My affections changed. I went, Oh my gosh, I I'm going to be a part of rectifying this. And so things changed. And I think we've got a lot to learn from that. And I think if we want to bring people on the journey with us, it's about bringing them on the journey with us. It's not about forcing them, you know um, what, you know, push gets pushed back, you know? So, it's really changing people's affections. And so I'd say when we start, it's, it, that's the first step. I, I, I have influence in my company. I have ability to do something. So the next thing I need to do is change people's affections. And it's for that reason that within our supply chain, if we find a problem, we, I don't believe in cancel culture. I think cancel culture, not always, but in, in most cases is probably a negative thing. Um, but what I do believe in is going, okay, here's a problem. How can we work with you to one, show you that this isn't the best way and support you in doing it better. Um, and when we do that, it works. It just works, but the other way doesn't work. <laughs> so by cancel culture, you mean, oh, well, I found something. So now I'm not going to use you anymore. Is that what yeah. you mean by cancel culture? Instead yeah. of that, you want to try and help them change how they approach things. Absolutely. But, but how do you do that? without having them put up their walls, right? Because it's a very fine line telling somebody that it, this is bad and showing them so that they change their affections. Yes. How do you yeah, do that? Cause yeah, you probably have a lot of experience I'm, in this now, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and not always successful. And that, that's the reality. You won't always be successful. That's okay. Um, but how I do you think, do it? But, but uh, what's well, the relationship? I love you, a relationship. I care for you. I'm actually, um, it's like, it's like whenever we go into any kind of conflict, we go in and we go, we have a bee on our bonnet. And I need to get my opinion forward. You need to hear me. It never goes down well. But when I go into a relationship where they feel like I do love them and I do care for them, regardless of whether we see eye to eye and everything, I still absolutely respect you. Um, I now have the ability to be able to speak gently into a situation. And trust me, this is hard for me because I'm more of a get the baseball bat out kind of guy. Um, I'm not, I'm not the, let's speak um, nicely. My, my dad used to I, always be saying to me, James, you need to put, just sugarcoat it a little bit. Would you sugarcoat it? Don't say it so directly. Don't, you know, um, and, it's a, and it's a big lesson to me. I need to, I've had to learn to go, um, don't be so arrogant. Like, you know, actually you don't know anyone that doesn't want to be a part of the change if they're given the opportunity. So just be gentle so that people can be learn what you've been able to learn. And there's so much I don't know, but, and, and I, and I have to now learn when people come to me in that way to receive it, you know? So yeah, it goes both ways, man, but it's a, it's, it's, I don't want to sound like, like, um, it's your intention though, right? It's it the is. intention. It's how you're it approaching is. it because everything is like, it's all words, but it, yeah. it's all changed by intention and by, yeah approaching it a certain way, you know, like yes. I'm not trying to be telling someone how it is, but more yeah. taking them on a journey, um, which is really, really interesting. Um, how does like from a HR perspective, from a culture perspective, you know, so what are some of the things which you've had to do to, in to ensure that the company is ethical in terms of everything internally as well as externally? Yeah. Um, 
Well, that comes that comes down to leadership, man. Like if 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 you're not prepared to sweep the floors, um, if 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 you want to sit in your ivory tower, um, you will create a different culture to the one if you want to sweep the floors. So I'm I'm a I'm a firm believer in that leadership is is um, about serving. It it really has to be. It's about I'm prepared to do the jobs that you have to do. Um, we have a a theory here that and it's um, that we will not expect anyone to work in a place that we wouldn't work ourselves. Um, and unfortunately, that doesn't translate across most um, through the garment manufacturing industry too well. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that you've, you know, it's, it, it's about culture. And so what is important to us as a brand? What is important to us as a company? And so the things that we do training on is um, the things that are important to us is honesty, integrity, and generosity. Um, they are real, they're, they're the pillars of our business. They're the pillars of the culture of our business. And if we lose that, we lose everything else. So when we talk about honesty, um, you know, how do, we, how do we communicate with each other? Um, how are we held accountable to things? Um, and what does it mean in, in the way we then flow that out through our supply chain? Um, integrity like how can we have any kind of integrity if we're not if we're going to go to the community with a story that's not true um again honesty um and generosity generosity is key um i don't know if you've ever watched the movie pay it forward it's an old movie but if you haven't you should watch it it's called pay it forward the concept is a little boy comes up with a school project and i'm going to ruin it for you now but he comes, <laughs> it's he fine it's fine <laughs> on uh, on something that would change the world and he comes up with this thing called pay it forward if i do something nice for you don't pay it back to me but pay it on to three other people and then those three other people they don't pay it back to the one who did it to the, for them but they pay it forward to three more and I love the concept and that's part of what we try to teach within our, um, our facility is that this pay it forward, you know, you don't owe Outland Adam anything, but you do owe it to your community. You do owe it to the next person who needs the opportunity. And one really cool story from that is, um, you know, I'll never forget hearing this story, but one of our staff um, whom had actually come from such a challenging background, you know, in the exploitation she had faced, but, her family actually lived under a plastic sheet. So, you know, under a tarpaulin, um, we don't even imagine what that's like, you know, but her mum, dad, siblings and herself lived under this. She got this job and she was able to um, build a home for her family. And it was, wow. was a, like a color bond roof, you know, tin roof and yep. um, wooden cladding. And it was like up off the ground. So in monsoon season, the flooding could go underneath and um, you know, what a feat, amazing. Not because of Outland Denham, but because of her own hard work, she did this. And so when you're somebody who may have shame from your past and you're doing this, your, your dignity has been reinstilled. She went on to buy her sister back from a man that owned her. And I mean, it's just unbelievable. So you go, oh, that's an amazing win. Okay, this works. If nothing else happens, this business model is working. But then a, a couple of years later, um, we got this story that, you know, there was this, this young lady on the streets that was really poor and very vulnerable um, and so this same girl went and set her up as a tailor on the street, used her own money to go and buy fabric um, to go and set this, this lady up. And so that's that pay it forward. So wow. imagine if you can do that with your staff where they go, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay it forward to somebody else rather than pay it back. COVID hits. I remember going around to all my staff and going, hey, guys, I don't know what's going to happen. This is really serious. Um, you know, all of our Australian staff in our HQ, you know what their first concern was? Our staff in Cambodia. Um, they, were, they were way less worried about whether they're going to have an income or not than they were with our staff in Cambodia. But then what's even better is that they were more worried about their, their colleagues here in Australia than they were themselves. And I think wow. that comes back to culture and the kind of people that work within your business. And um, we, we have a business full of people that are so compassionate and driven to be able to help the next person um and that's what ensures that we maintain integrity right throughout our supply chain wow um it 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 feels so good to hear those kinds of stories you know and so i think like it is worth um the effort um to see actually how the decisions that somebody makes actually affects the world and if they can kind of just shift it 
just a little bit to start yeah. with, just a little bit, like yeah. across the world, yeah? yeah, across business, you know, yeah. just a couple of percent this way, the impact yeah. that that will have is very, very big. And I think that's probably one of the reasons um, that the equity crowdfunding campaign has done so well, right? Because like yeah. you, um, you raise over $1.3 million from over a thousand people, yeah. right? Yeah. And that was in the middle of a pandemic. Like yeah. how did that happen? Like you launched, a, like, yeah, could you just spend a couple of minutes just talking about that? Yeah. You know, like, yeah. but how did that happen? Well, I mean, look, we were, the, the reason we wanted to do equity crowdfunding, we've always wanted this to be the people's brand, a brand that benefited as many people from beginning to end as possible. And so this seemed like the best way to be able to achieve that was to go, hey, I want you to actually have equity in this company. I want you to own shares. And so I want you to benefit from the success of this business as well. Um, so putting that out to a community was, was scary during a pandemic. Of course there was doubt, but more of me was excited about what could happen. And in fact, it was, I think even more exciting because we were right amongst the pandemic that everyone thought it was going to fail. Um, and for it to have the level of success that it did have was, was pretty mind blowing. I think for, for everybody watching on, but it proved something. It proved that there is a new impact investment model. And we surveyed our thousand investors after the raise about why they invested. And 83% of the people who invested in Outland Denim invested because of the social um, impact associated to the ability to have a return. So this is your new impact investor. You talk about impact investing in Australia. And I, I've often said uh, publicly that I think impact investing in Australia is, is pretty um, archaic. I don't think it's very sophisticated. Um, and I don't really think that all measures are being used to measure the impact or value of a company. Um, they're really just using the same metrics as old school, not impact investing companies. Right. To yeah. value. So, so what's exciting about this equity crowdfunding movement is that now you've got these these micro investors or retail investors that are going to completely change the world because they're going to back the stuff that has impact. And I think this was the perfect example of how even amongst a pandemic, you can have success if you have customers or your community aligns with the same values as you do. And you know what? I'm excited for Outland Denim's success because I think that most people's values probably, if they really stop to think about it, do align with Outland Denim's and therefore I only see our community growing. That's awesome. That's well, it's, it's such a good story. I just, uh, so just before we finish, um, some quick fire questions, yeah? You know, just like yeah, yeah. Yeah. the first thing that comes to mind. If you had to choose just one channel or tactic for growth, what would you choose? Oh, digital, for sure. Digital marketing. Cool. Yeah. Digital marketing. Uh, what book has had the biggest impact on your success? The Bible. The Bible. Yeah. That's the first time I've heard that one. That's <laughs> great. Uh, so what's your number one piece of advice for hiring awesome people? Uh, what's more important than their skill set um, is their character. A second question on that point. Uh, so how do you kind of assess character quickly like in an interview? Um, it's very difficult, um, but, but I think quite quickly you can assess people's character through the right questions. And I, I, I think I get a quite a sense of people's character quite quickly. Yeah. Uh, so how do you relax after a crazy day at the office? A cold beer. <laughs> nice one. What's your best time management or productivity tip? Oh, I have, I'm the last person on earth to go down with. I'd like to reverse that question. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. What's the best piece of business advice that you've ever received? Operate with integrity. And lastly, what do you do for fun? Oh, man, fun. I, I don't remember that, what that is. No, uh, I'm... <laughs> I'm, I only say to my uh, wife, it's like, oh man, all my hobbies, like I can't, I can't do them anymore. I'm so busy and I've got a young family. But if I, if I had the time um, and we're in fast forward a few years, um, uh, I used to, you know, race motocross and, you know, go out to the track and that kind of thing. Um, can't, I love camping. I love the outback. I love exploring. Yeah. That's wow. Cool. Fantastic. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and what's next in terms of Outland Denim, you know, what's the plan from here? 
really excited. We're, we've launched um, Maker Standard, which is the highest ethical standard um, that you can get. So everything we produce will mean that the social, environmental, and economic impact of that product um, has met our standards. Um, and we're just now releasing this. We're going to be um, selling blank T-shirts um, so that schools and organizations, restaurants um, uh, can easily partake in that. We're going to be selling them at wholesale prices so that we can get more people involved in being a part of this movement um, and, and then producing for other brands as well so that we're able to stamp everything we produce so that brands can go to the marketplace with this story of we are now a part of this movement and this change. The people that are listening right now, like if they want to contact you about this, how do they get in touch to find out like how to actually get your product, you know? Yeah, yeah. Look, they can come directly to Outland Denim or they can go to Maker Standard. Maker is M-A-E-K-A, Standard. Um, you can go to our Instagram and, and um, we've only just launched it all, but it's, um, it's all there. And, you know, so it'll be a, a nice slow growth. There's no big, um, there's no fireworks for the launch or anything like that. This is just a progression of Outland Denim. Um, in furthering the the reach that we can have, and if you and this is just um, and let me see how I go with this last one, but but if people that are listening to this podcast actually want to pay it forward, you know, in terms of the information that they have received from you today, like how can they do that? You know, so what's something small which you'd like them to do? And you know, the smallest thing which I think has such a such a huge impact is just the way we interact with people. Just, it might be just a smile. It might be just looking for being able to open the door for someone. Um, simple. Uh, man, I reckon that stuff has, has such a powerful impact on someone else's day. Um, look for the little things. Hey, such a pleasure to speak to you today. Um, you have stirred up some the feelings in me, which is, I think, the whole kind of social impact thing, you know, and I think that's cool. kind of, the biggest part about it. Um, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, man. And like, I'm so happy for everything which you're doing and all the success that um, it has Amazing. come with it. So grateful, man. Thanks so much for having me. Man, thanks so much, man. See you later. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Growth Manifesto podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please head on over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. For more episodes, please visit growthmanifesto.com forward slash podcast.